Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel on cloud native perspectives, understanding and advocating for accessibility in tech. And today we're going to deep dive into what accessibility means in the realm of tech. And all of our panelists and myself each live with different disabilities and challenges. So throughout this, we're going to share our unique journeys, the barriers that we face, and the victories. And this session isn't just about us talking about the challenges and problems that we actually go through. It's about supporting and promoting solutions that can help and really make a difference. So please allow me to introduce myself and the other panelists. So, my name is James Spurin. I, I have my own company called Dive Into, where I create Kubernetes courses. My disability is a very rare type of motor neuron disease. Fortunately, one of the only ones which doesn't kill you, but it does affect my walking. Hence, I've actually got the crutches on the stage. And Rin? Hi, I'm Rin Mancuso, they, them pronouns. Um, I work at Honeycomb IO as a developer community manager, and um, I'm um, one of the maintainers for um, the open telemetry and user SIG. Um, I um, have a chronic illness that affects um, the connection between my brain and heart, um, which means that if I stand for too long, I might get lightheaded or pass out. So navigating the conference center can be pretty tricky. Oh, Devin, you have your own mic. You guys hear me? Oh, yep. Okay. So my name is Devin Nance. I'm a solution architect at VMware by Broadcom now. Since Broadcom just bought VMware, as some people probably know. Uh, I am blind, totally blind. I went blind from several accidents when I was a kid um, and have just uh, worked in the IT field. I went to college and got a degree in computers and worked at IBM for 10 or 15 years and then did some other consulting work and then got to VMware and, and now I'm at uh, VMware by Broadcom. Hello, my name is Purvi Kanal. Uh, I'm a software engineer and I work at Honeycomb IO. I'm also involved in the open telemetry community project, namely in the JavaScript space focused on web browsers. Um, and I identify, I, I've been diagnosed with ADHD and, and autism later in life. Um, and I, I care very deeply about web, web accessibility. I've been working um, in, in the space of web and web accessibility for about 10 years. Um, and yeah, I was just really thinking about moving through the world with a disability justice lens and viewing disability as a way to ask for your, your accommodations more than um, something that might disqualify you from participating in things. And I'll hand it over to Manuel. Thank you, Pierre. Hi, my name is Emmanuel. I, uh, I am deaf. So I use a, a app for action to follow you, to understand you. So I'm, my eye is uh, on the, my phones. I am a developer to Shodo in Paris. I'm French, of course. And um, I'm involved in the group CNCF Dev and head of everyone in group to explain about accessibility for deaf people. And uh, I, um, I fight uh, every day for accessibility and the, the web is, for, is very important to us, to a uh, website will be, which be accessible for all. Beautiful, thank you, thanks everyone. Um, Pervy, I'm going to actually start with with you. You um, you mentioned there the autism and ADHD, and these are two areas in particular that are very close to me. I've 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 got children who've got autism. My wife has ADHD, and it's something I actually see in all manners of of, of life as a 
as a, as a challenge. It's these areas are often overlooked. They're not given the support and recognition that they actually deserve. And would love to, to know more about how this has actually been a factor for you, your own experiences, and some of your strategies for this. Um, yeah, so I, um, I got, I sort of like came to these diagnoses later in life, so I wasn't diagnosed as a child. Um, and it kind of started with um, discovering my, my ADHD and, and getting that diagnosis, and it was such a different experience than when I um, got my autism diagnosis as well. There's still, I find, quite a stigma around autism as compared to ADHD. Um, one, one nice thing about that I found working in tech was that um, I found generally uh, neurodivergence can be overrepresented compared to other industries that I'd worked in previously. And so it was nice to be around in spaces that felt much more comfortable for me because there were more accommodations. Um, but even as yeah, so some of the challenges are, you know, accommodations for, for neurodivergence. And I want to stress that this shows up differently for um, everybody with, with um, neurodivergence. So this is just my personal experience. So big conferences can be really, really overwhelming. There's a lot of people um, really grateful to be able to have badges that can indicate the level of interaction. Um, also, just at work longer meetings are really, really difficult. I'm sure they're difficult for, for everybody, but especially the level of like autistic burnout that I experience after hours and hours of, of long meetings. Um, and um, there's like all sorts of different ways that it you know shows up for me from everything from like sensory issues with like lights and sounds um, to just everyday social interactions. So being able to indicate to people that interact with me often like my teammates like almost like give them a read me of like hey if I'm not making eye contact with you or if I show up to a meeting and I'm knitting and doing something with my hands I'm actually paying more attention than if I'm here making eye contact with you and like masking because it takes all of my concentration to mask rather than just show up as I am. And, and, and just for the audience's benefit, for those who haven't heard of that term masking, how would you quickly summarize that? Yes. Um, so masking is, is something that um, arguably we all do, which is putting on a social appearance. So that might mean as an autistic person, I find it quite uncomfortable to make eye contact or smile or nod at the right time. So to seem engaged with you in conversation, I might show, I might do those activities, but I'm almost like going through the motions as this is how I'm supposed to show up. So that takes a lot of like extra effort and a lot of like cognitive resources to, to do that. Brilliant. And, and, and that area masking now is something which positively, a, a little bit of a change I've actually seen they, they're trying to promote now with from a younger age, not to actually mask it, whereas historically it's always been need to actually hide this and fall into a mantra, which is completely wrong. Brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Pervy. Um, Emmanuel, I'm going to move on to you next. And something which I found really interesting when looking into the background on your area was that there's 466 million people, so 5% of the world, are hard of hearing or deaf. And if this was a country by itself, it would be the third biggest country in the world. So I'd love to um, have you share your experience as a deaf developer. Yes, thank you. Um, as I'm, uh, as uh, I'm deaf, I need earshot a lot, and earshot um, uh, is uh, quite a challenge because uh, with artificial intelligence, uh, we see a lot of uh, automatic emission. and uh, when uh, we see, uh, use it in the, um, uh, in the meetings. Uh, Sometimes, uh, I'm sure it's not very accurate, 
Yeah, there are uh, a lot of uh, errors uh, sometimes uh, uh, depend on a uh, person to speak with accent. Uh, but for example, I have an accent deaf and French accent, and uh, when I speak here, uh, yeah, I don't understand at all. And uh, if I uh, if I saw this up. I see that it doesn't work <laughs> very much. And um, uh, we must, um, we must uh, work on uh, M-Shot a, a lot because um, in... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I take my note. I'm just an uh, we, uh, we are not one of them. One percent of ancient because he had a, a lot of errors. As a reader, we forced to make mental uh, substitution to understand erroneous automatic M shot is quite exhausting. Very exhausting, especially in the real time. So, uh, it's amazing if offers, but um, if you put a video in the web, you, you have uh, automatic emption, but uh, you must write uh, it. It's very important. You have time. You, uh, you write in a file with emption and write it. It's a format. And uh, we have a lot of uh, deaf people use the sign, of sign language. Uh, sign language is not universal. Each country has its own sign language. French sign language, American sign language, British sign language, etc. There's even an uh, Indian sign language as well. Yes. yes. Uh, multiple language and multiple sign language. Uh, for now, we have a lot of studies about avatars, 3G, 3G, and uh, we are just beginning. And, uh, it's, uh, very an opportunity to uh, make uh, avatar uh, 3D accessible for uh, deaf people to, who use um, sign language. But um, for now, they are uh, not very agreeing because uh, they act like remote. Uh, we need uh, expressive uh, 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 opereal. Gotcha. Yeah, that's really kind. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And Rin, I'm going to move on to you. And um, your, your, your challenges are ones that I personally relate to in a lot of ways. And, and myself, I limit myself to KubeCon and DockerCon as my conferences only. But I know with you as a developer advocate, you do many of these conferences with many different challenges. And what's your insights and experiences in these areas? Sure, yeah. I'm a developer advocate. Um, and the good thing about my particular role is that um, my team enjoys a diversity of tactics, so I, cannot, I, can, I could not go to conferences for six months if I wanted to. Having said that, it puts me at a disadvantage in my field because so many people are out there speaking publicly at conferences, so I do try to attend many of them. Um, there's lots of different challenges that people with disabilities face. You've heard Emmanuel talk about the challenge with having interpreters, as well as the fatigue of trying to switch visually between looking at captions that are maybe on your phone and looking at the speaker's lips. Um, you've heard Pervy talk about being overwhelmed in the space because there's so much noise, so much stimuli or distracted. Um, and I'm sure when it comes to Devin's turn, he might talk about the challenges navigating a space when you um, can't see. Um, but personally, um, I think it's difficult to move around the conference center. If you think about how crowded it is here um, with 13,000 people, um, 
it's very easy when you have a mobility aid because your profile is a little different than others for people to run into you, to run into your aid, for people to stop in front of you and get out their phone because they're trying to check where they're going but haven't bothered to realize that people are walking around them. Um, it's a process of sort of constant vigilance that you don't run into anyone or hit anyone. Um, and it's extra exhausting and takes more time to get anywhere. Um, I'll always plan out my KubeCon schedule and then have to scratch like half the things or reorganize so that I'm in a very small area, depending on what the map actually looks like, depending on how navigable the conference center turns out to be. And you can't usually tell this from maps in advance. Um, most um, conference centers don't put it on their website. The information that disabled people need to navigate the space is just not out there. And then, just like Emmanuel, I deal with a lot of fatigue from both having to do all this and having um, an illness that causes fatigue, frankly. And I have to very much ration my time. People with chronic illness sometimes call this spoons. Once you're out of spoons for the day, you're done. And most people have relatively infinite spoons. They might get a little worn down, but it's okay. And if you have chronic illness, you have just a few, and you have to really think about it. Yeah, that's really, that's really kind. Thanks for sharing that, Ren. And uh, Devin, we, we had the pleasure of catching up yesterday, and your experience and, and your, your background absolutely has blown me away with all of the different uh, careers that you've actually done, the different areas that you've worked in, and I was absolutely blown away by how much of a champion you are in this area with with everything that you're 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 doing, and no challenge seems to phase you. And w what I would like to know from a, um, a a disability perspective. What has your experience been like? Are there particular types of jobs that you would actually go for? And are there ones that you would flat out avoid? Um, yeah, so you know, we kind of talked about that a little bit. And uh, it's, it's changed over time. So I, I use a, a tool called a screen reader, which and then the one I use is called JAWS, and it's an acronym for Job Access with Speech. And, uh, and, it, and you know, it evolves, it's gotten better over time as technology changes, you know, it has to keep up with um, technology as well. And so um, it reads the information on the screen, it reads the controls and things like that and, and to, to get to your question. So in the past, you know, it doesn't always work with everything really well. You know, there may be you know, some office software that it, it just doesn't work with because they haven't tested the office software to work with that. You know, maybe there's not keyboard navigation um, and things, that's actually the biggest one really is the keyboard navigation or the labeling of some of the controls, right? And so they, it doesn't read it. So I don't know what the control does. Um, so things like that are, you know, so I would avoid jobs um, that, I, you know, the tools I could, I knew I couldn't use the tools, right? Because you want to be as independent as possible when you're, you're doing your job. Um, but then some of the other jobs I would avoid were, you know, at, when I started out in my career, I was a developer and uh, obviously there's the presentation layer and there's the back end pieces of software. So I would try to avoid the presentation layer just to be honest, trying to, you know, create something that's visually appealing and you can't see it is, is not the easiest thing to do, right? You, you may know how to set up all the keyboard navigation. You might have to make sure everything works, you know, functions correctly, but making sure something's visually. So I, I, I tend to do avoid the, those jobs and just work on the developing on the back end. But then as my career, you know, as I've gotten, I did some architecture work. I did, you know, I was a, I've, I've been a team lead. Um, presenting to other folks was always a little bit of a challenge. So I would try to avoid work where I had to present something where I was describing something visually. Um, or even, you know, PowerPoint itself was not the easiest tool to use. Well, I'm, I'm glad to say that PowerPoint has certainly improved and with JAWS it's improved so I can, you know, I can create a basic presentation now. You know, it's probably not the, you know, most glamorous or, anim, you know, with a lot of animation and whatnot, but it's, it's, it's a very good presentation. So I can even do that now and I feel, you know, and I feel comfortable doing it. So technology has really evolved and it's given me a lot of freedom to, to, to try lots of different jobs. I'm 
as I was telling James yesterday, as I, I love to learn new things and try new things. And technology has given me that um, ability to go on the internet and, and get whatever information I want to learn about, whether it's in my field at work or it's something outside of work I want to learn, whether it's, you know, um, just personal entertainment type stuff or hobbies or things like that. The, the technology and the ability to gain information is, is so phenomenal these days. It's, you know, it's, it's still, you know, could use some improvement. There's still obstacles, uh, obstacles that, you know, I, I, you know, come I encounter with, you know, the keyboard navigation not working or, or things like that. But, um, but there's just so, so many things have improved and gotten so much better and the awareness that, uh, that other companies. And if we, you know, if we just continue down that road of making sure everyone has access to information, um, whether you would like it from, you know, keyboard input and output, um, on the screen or you want it um, through a uh, hearing impaired device or, or you want it through your voice, you know, your smart device. There's so many ways now that you can gain information. That's really the key is to that, that, that interface between the, the well, I call the, and we've used the term, not, I didn't come up with this term, but the virtual world and the physical world, right? And that, that, that interface between those two where you can gain the information and gain the awareness of what's going on is really so important. So, um, yeah, that's about what I got. Yeah, that's amazing. And I, I think one of the bits which really jumped out when we, um, when we bumped into each other yesterday was where you was explaining where in your current role, where you're working in pre-sales and you're actually going through, you're setting things up. You have people on the call often and you're doing this and you could be going through for quite a while and then you get that question, oh, but what's that on the screen and they haven't actually even realized this whole time which is yeah that's 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 quite an incredible feat it's amazing very very uh very inspiring um what we're going to do with this point of the um this point of the panel is we're going to move on to some uh s some questions in some different areas and essentially anyone can actually then pick these up as we go through so the first question is, where do you think we actually stand in terms of accessibility in technology and what key areas really need to be addressed and prioritized in the next five years? Is there anyone in particular? Devin, go for it. Um, and I, I, I kind of mentioned this a little bit, and it's just that, that awareness. So it, it, what I would really like to see, and this has been a, a topic that we, we talk about quite a bit uh, from, a, from a blind person's point of view and, and you know, other accessibility, if you, if you get the, uh, when you're doing the development, if you make sure in the early stages of the development, you consider accessibility. It's, it, it's when you get too far along you, you, and, it's, and something's not working, that's the, that becomes a major problem, right? Because you can't go back and rework everything or it's, it's too caustic, you know, it's too, um, it's too cost prohibitive. So if, if you make sure in the early stages when you're designing things or working through your iterative processes, you, you have accessibility in there as a foundation, just like security, right? Or just like the infrastructure or one of those pillars that you have in your development that, that, a framework that you're saying, I want this to be a, a, a pillar in my development process, right? So as long as accessibility is one of those pillars, I, I think we can really gain a lot of ground going forward in the next five years. Brilliant, and ju just to add to that with a, a, a bit of a personal insight on my view with this, I see a lot of things with accessibility in different areas and whilst, whilst you actually see many striving towards accessibility, it's, it's kind of treated like a bit of a tick box exercise in many different areas. So there may be a requirement to actually do something and that requirement will be fulfilled, but has that requirement actually been done well? And unless you're actually on the receiving end of seeing this and depending on it, you don't actually realize how impactful and useless this is and um, someone actually came to me with one of my courses and and said when are you going to have the the captions done and I was like oh 
okay, you, you, you need the captions. And it's like, yes, I am fully deaf. I cannot actually consume your course without the captions. And look down the route of auto-generated captions. And I mean, it's, a, it's an abysmal experience. And even with work helping with KubeCon, um, my, there's going to be some videos on Friday which helped out with and actually did the, the, the captions for these. And I mean, it was awful. Um, you know, Envoy was constantly Android. And what was even more confusing was Envoy were actually talking about Android. So it was Android talking about Android. And, and, and another favorite was it, it's not SIG docs, it's sick docs. <laughs> so that's, that's one of my areas in, in, in five years. And I, I do hope that there's some laws passed which actually says it's not just about having accessibility, it's about that accessibility being to a high standard, whether it's um, maneuverability around the building, whether it's captions, whether it's um, supporting software for screen readers, it really needs to improve. Um, the, the next question I've got here is, how well does AI represent and address disability challenges? And especially after the keynote today, we all saw that AI was a very hot topic. Um, how do people feel about AI with their, their, their disabilities? Do you see it as beneficial? Where do you see some improvements? Anyone in particular like to take that? Thanks, Rania. Um, as uh, we know, artificial intelligence is a reflection of society. And uh, what society see about disability is implied to the artificial intelligence. Uh, first time when I asked uh, to um, meet your name to draw a disabled person, is always someone is a wheelchair. But disability is not only wheelchair. We have uh, so many other disabilities. We are like uh, deafness, visual impairment, uh, autism which are uh, invisible uh, disabilities, and uh, AI don't need that. Uh, the first time I asked uh, to mention it, to do me a deaf woman. And uh, in she narrated a very, very old woman. Do I do old? Because uh, I I don't, um, uh, this, I, I'm not this woman, I'm young. Daphnet is just affected an early, so uh, yeah, I don't get uh, about Daphnet, it's uh, a lifetime. AI uh, yeah, is a horrible opportunity to create good product to make every day easier to, for people with disabilities, like automatic emission, we talk about our CI for uh, uh, blind people to never view. And uh, AI is a uh, very well automatic term, in, is, um, but uh, is very important to work with uh, disabled people in day to hear, uh, hear them and train them uh, to have a better representation, to create a product, accessible product, to help uh, people, disabled people. It's very important. But uh, the, there is a lack of uh, reputation of disabled people in the data. There is a lot of stereotypes uh, around disability. To improve that, we need the to be inclusive is very important. When you design project to make every day life easier for disabled people, do it with disabled people. Nothing about us without us. We don't do it, the BAs will be 
persist and we create more inaccessibilities and produce inaccessible. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think at this point it's probably a good time to move to some Q&A. Just quickly before we do, uh, a lot of us with disabilities and challenges, we rely on a lot of people for help behind the scenes. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out because I know that Catherine's going to be leaving, but Catherine did a lot of work behind the scenes on actually putting this together. So a, a big thank you to Catherine. Is there anybody who has brilliant? Come, come on over, sir. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Kadir. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, I design workshops, and I want to also uh, design a workshop for accessibility and inclusion in the workspace, but particularly for tech communities. And um, I, I did some research and usually uh, these topics, they have some uh, training content or like workshop content, but um, they are actually quite basic and obviously we need a lot of um, perspective and everybody have their own um, angle to this uh, topic. So my question is like, is there any organization or some individuals that you can recommend so we learn more from them in order to uh, properly design a workshop? So it would be more impactful in our work area. Thank you very much again. Amazing, thank you. Does anyone have some views in particular? I, I can give a suggestion. I don't have a, a particular organization to, to point to, but it's, it's definitely helpful to do the work to find folks with different accessibility needs and because at some point I assume you're going to test your workshop out um, so it would be uh, that like one of the best things to do is just find folks with vari varying disability needs for however your workshop is presented and make sure that you're testing it out with them and centering centering their experiences in it um, did, did somebody else have a and maybe an organization Um, I believe Inclusively is doing training um, and I'm hearing that there is an accommodations platform out there, although I don't remember the name. Um, I personally feel that this is the biggest place that we need to grow in cloud native, both making contribution opportunities accessible, things like making sure that captions are turned on in video meetings, that we engage interpreters for project meetings, and that for um, jobs, you'll notice three of us work for, three of you work for yourselves, and two of us work for the same company that is exceptionally inclusive. Um, employment rates for people with disabilities in general are pretty low, like 10%, and and we need desperately to empower people to understand that accommodations don't have to be expensive, that disabled pe people can be good employees and reliable employees, and that they can make those accommodations. Yeah, and, and just quickly to add to that, I mean, um, any, any way that you can actually put yourself into the perspective of various different personas would be really helpful. And I, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I, I, pretty much switched careers because I didn't want to be doing this commute any longer with the challenges with the sticks etc so um, looking around at different things how accessible is a venue can you actually get to it easily what's the access like what's the internals like would all be super helpful hello uh I don't have really a question, but I would like to share. Uh, I would like to share um, a personal experience. Uh, I'm visually impaired, uh, so sorry uh, if I don't see you on the eye. Um, and I had uh, in the past the occasion to take a, to make a presentation into a conference, and. Uh, when I come on the scene, 
uh, in front of the computer, that the computer was provided by the venue, uh, I were just not able to read my own slide and see no, absolutely nothing. And I just had to guess my slide, uh, improvise for the whole uh, presentation. Uh, and in addition, I'm pretty glad uh, to see today that uh, the venue uh, had made many accommodations from many disabilities, but unfortunately for visually impaired people, we really rely on uh, the, the presentator. Definitely uh, from many people, I just can't uh, read or see the slides. Uh, many uh, venue don't provide the slide uh, in advance or so and I think we have many things to do uh, for visually impaired people uh, uh, in adaptation in conference. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, and was there any other questions from the crowd? Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. Sorry if I'm reading my notes. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask uh, uh, if you have any suggestion uh, for uh, tools or bad, uh, best practice uh, that can help act activities like uh, hackathons or sharing ideas between uh, colleagues. Uh, in our company, we usually use tools like Miro. Uh, it's like pinning um, post-its on the wall, and we think it's not very accessible. So we are looking for alternatives. So we ask if you know any tool or bad practice for these uh, activities. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Rin? not having people stay up all night for hackathons, um, <laughs> considering that folks might not be healthy enough to do that kind of work is an important accommodation you can offer people with disabilities. Um, so I use all sorts of tools, but you're, I think you mentioned Miro and yeah, Miro was very challenging. Um, from a, from a blind person's perspective, but visually impaired. I've actually been come up with all kinds of solutions <laughs> with um, drawing, uh, with whiteboards. I, I took an actual physical uh, whiteboard and shared it with, you know, through the uh, Zoom link. And then I had my son actually create a 3D print image, 3D print. I took the images that we were gonna use in the different whiteboarding session and he printed out with his 3D printer so I could feel it tactilely on the board, um, and then we would magnet, you know, and slap them on the board where that way I could feel them. And then once I got my, once I felt them, um, so that's probably a, little bit, probably a little bit more outside of the scope of what you're asking and being creative, but it was, um, it was a way that I could uh, use a whiteboard. And it's more a, an in-person type of whiteboarding session is, is making sure that the different um, constructs are, are, are tactile so I can touch them and feel them and figure out which ones are which. These, in this case, it was a routing uh, architecture design for some NSXT stuff. So we were doing routers and switches and things like that. But, I, um, but things like that where you actually put your hands on it um, was something I used. Um, there used to be some tools for UML diagramming and I'm trying to think of the names that, that I used that were fairly accessible. Eclipse is fairly accessible. For, for coding and, and various things. Uh, like I mentioned, PowerPoint's pretty accessible now for basic things, um, but whiteboarding is still a challenge for, for visually impaired folks. So I don't have a better answer than that. In terms, of, um, in terms of captions and subtitles, if any of you are actually in that space where you're creating videos, the personal workflow I have myself and one that I'm actively sharing at the moment, uh, Descript is the best tool I've actually found for this in terms of getting that initial base of, of captions and subtitles. That will get you 95% of the way just with dropping a, a, a video or an audio file. It is still important that you actually go through that process at the end of it and fix up the mistakes, the, the, the various ones that I actually mentioned earlier. But that does a really good job and 
something in particular I like about that tool, um, the, the, the cost is negligible. It's you know, $12 or so to actually use it. And the export options export to all of the industry standards. So if you're actually putting anything out there and it needs to actually be consumed internally or if you are actually putting out to a wider audience, that's a real nice way of, of getting things done quite quickly um, and to a high standard. And outside of that, when you're actually working on anything from a, a, a slide perspective, you always want to be looking at a, a minimum of 14 points as your, as your font. And I say that as a minimum. If you can actually go up as a base um, higher from the, from, from the start, that will really help. And um, when, especially in tech, where you're actually doing screen sharing and you're, you're, you're showing these different things on Zoom calls, just make it your habit. As soon as you actually switch and you bring up that terminal, hold that command key, hit plus, multiple times and, and use it regularly. So adjust it to the content. So run a command, have it fill the screen. And if you run something and you've occupied a bit too much, resize and go back down and then resize and go back up. And it, it will make your, your content better in general anyway, but it will also appeal to a much larger audience. And uh, we have also uh, 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 when I'm in front of accessibility or the WCIG web accessibility, we are a lot of great area to make a website accessible. So for the Ayaton or, or design project, we have uh, WCA with nine. Nice. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, hello. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your experience. I find it very valuable. And I have a question. You mentioned already the employment rate for people with disabilities. As a part of the team, as a part of the company, I want more people with disabilities working together with me. So my question to you is, what is your requirement when you're considering the job switch, when you are thinking about your dream job, what you will pay attention when thinking if you want to work in this company or maybe not. And maybe that's something that team also can do, that I can do from my side. Thank you. Because uh, um, uh, formation are very few accessible for disabled people, you must uh, form them hire them and uh, form them with uh, amenagement for uh, accessibility amenagement is very important. Uh, for example, uh, for deaf people provide a chapter or option for uh, other disability accessible for screen reader, with screen reader, light, uh, uh, place, uh, accessible place, etc. is uh, very important to take the uh, needs of uh, each disability to hire them and uh, train them. Yeah, I would say, um, sorry. Um, I'll just say quickly that um, it's similar to what Emmanuel said. It's, it's really about understanding that there's no blanket experience and um, centering the ex experience of different disabilities is, is really important. Um, and yeah, making sure that things are, all of the tools that you use are um, accessible at a very base need, but also have those vetted by people with those disabilities who work in the industry. And then from a neurodivergence perspective, um, there's a lot of accommodations that are, it, it would be hard for me to like imagine working without. And also one of the biggest ones is the ability to be an inconsistent person. 
which means that I might show up one day very differently than another day, making sure that there's adequate policies in place to protect disabled people and their employment, like disability leave. People also might become disabled as, um, as they're an employee. So you might start out not disabled and you might become disabled. So it's important to have those protections in, in place. I just want to add to that because I, I think you, you raised a, a, a brilliant point and in, in answer to your question I would actually say that the most important thing from my viewpoint would be the empathy, the kindness and the respect and consideration because it, it can vary so so much and th this, was, this was one of the, the, the put-offs for me it was that kind of lack of understanding um, I'll give a, a, a prime example. Um, you, you could get a really cold day for me, for example, and whilst I've got the challenges walking on a really cold day, I'm kind of like Tin Man, <laughs> and it's, you're, you're in so much more danger when you're there, you're trying to actually commute, you're trying to do these things, and Sadly, more often than not, you will hit this 1980s mentality. Oh, you know, well, just put a coat on. And it's like, well, really? We're coding. We're doing these great things here. We're working with complex technologies. Do you think we did not actually think of that? And that's the... I think when you actually look at that from a big perspective, it's it's very, very challenging. And... and you, you actually mentioned a really good point there that sometimes people actually do become disabled. And this, this, this was the case for me. I, I, I wasn't disabled my whole life. It hit me when I was in my 30s. And people go through really bad times. They go through depression. They go through having to get help and, and support from other people. And you actually said it there with the masking. The masking can take very different different forms. And there's many great organizations. I think a, a lot of the organizations, which are the, the top ones, the well-knowns, they, they do this really, really well. And speaking to some of my, my friends, the support which is actually there for people who are uh, disabled is brilliant in a lot of the organizations which are the, the big players in this area but it's it's a minefield elsewhere and anything that you can actually do to promote and really drive that home that hey you know this this person's probably doing their best year they, they might be having a, a a bad day and especially in all, all of these different areas, e each one of us here, I have no doubt that we all have these bad days in various different ways. And we might just need to sack off that day, but we're still working hard the rest of the week or we will catch up in our own time. And yeah, any kind of understanding and drive of that would be a huge win for all of us. And I think we're out of time, everyone. Thank you.